Well, um, Jonas, I think it would be. I'd I'd love to talk to you about your seven myths. Okay. Um, perhaps the best thing would be for you to say what they are first, mm-hmm. and then we'll discuss them one by one. Would that work for you? That's perfect for me. Yeah, I'm very happy I get the opportunity. The seven secular myths about religion, which I described in the article that you read, and which I've written a book about and I hope to publish one day in in English. The seven myths are just the most general comments I think you hear when people talk about religion, uh, whether it's in the pub or on TV or anywhere. The first myth of about religion is that religion starts from faith, from belief, from things you have in your head and which you think are true and the truthfulness is first and foremost in your life. It kind of creates your identity. And if it isn't the truth and the things that you believe, it's the things that you have to do to be either a Christian or a Muslim or whatever. The things that uh, rituals and practices that you need to follow And if you don't follow them, then you're supposedly not a real religious person. So that would be the first myth. Then the second myth is that religions are hierarchies, institutionalized religion, as they often call it. Like religions are made out of priests who then dictate what the believers should believe or what they should do. Then the third myth is that you can easily separate them, that you have like because they believe in certain things and because they do certain things and other religions don't do and believe in the same things, then they, they, they're they clearly separated. You've got Muslims there and you've got Christians there and you've got um, Hindus there and you've got Jews on the other side, something like that. And then the fourth myth is the, which is a pretty modern one, but it's it's gradually growing in in Western Europe and in in, in the US at least. Uh, And so that's the division between spirituality and religion, as if you can separate the two, which makes a lot of people, and it's actually in most Western countries, it's about 25% of people claiming that they're spiritual, but not religious. So the, the fact that you can say it, I'm spiritual, but not religious, means that somehow it's clear for people that they're is a difference, even though that difference might not always be that clear. And then the fifth myth is the, which is one you are very familiar with, that religion and science can't go together, that they're opposites and that they have a tension and that there's this conflict between science and religion because religion is built on faith and not on rational approaches like science is. And then the sixth myth is that if we would get rid of religion, then finally there would be peace on earth and there would be a lot less violence because religion is by far the most um, aggressive force in the world, killing most people uh, all through history. And then the seventh uh, myth is a bit built on on the first six. It's that the secular world or a secular society is completely different than a religious society because A, you don't have to start from a certain faith, you don't have to do certain things, uh, you're more rational, you're less violent, and so on and so on. So this is the contrast between religion and secularism, as if that's a uh, evident and and uh, normal way to divide the world. So that's what I think are the seven myths, and I call them myths because I think none of those seven ideas, all, all, although they are dominant, uh, actually all over the world right now, um, although they are dominant, I don't believe they're they're actually factually true when you really look at what the reality of religion is. Well, thank you for summarizing them. I. I think this is a really, really helpful summary because, you know, I recognize those myths. I'm sure most people would. Um, They may not think of them as myths, but as assumptions or at least common opinions. And until now, until I came across your work, I'd never seen anyone sort of crystallize them. they're, They're sort of diffuse. They're not normally set out in that way. They're not normally set out as a kind of secular creed with these seven points of view. Uh, But we somehow absorb them from secular culture. They're they're not explicitly taught, uh, as far as I can think. I mean, when I look around, where do these come from in the society around me? I mean, they're very, very widespread. But 
they're just sort of implicit assumptions that come out in dialogues and conversations and newspaper articles and in the educational system all the time um, as common assumptions, shared assumptions. But rather like the dogmas of science, they're not explicitly taught and therefore not explicitly discussed. So I think that your um, ability to focus on these is is very, very helpful. And um, I mean, before we get into more details about the actual myths, um, what's your view on how they're propagated? Why are they so widespread in the world today? I mean, how do they diffuse and how did they get going? Yeah, I think the same thing. They're just, they're simply widespread. There are these assumptions which are which are a bit everywhere. Sometimes they're discussed by one by one, mostly. So a scientist will claim that science, well, it's obvious that science has been better than religion was in in history and so on. And you can actually easily trace that particular view on religion and the clash between uh, science and religion. It's It's really traceable to a couple of books in the end of the 19th century, which started to propagate a bunch of ideas. But then that's one thing. There used to be books really telling those things. But on the other hand, some of the ideas being propagated in the books, which weren't based on factual historic uh, uh, data, um, some of those ideas just caught on. But that's that's one aspect because you could say that about a lot of ideas. But why these? Because for me, there's a whole lot of political... Um, well, political and, and social psychological reason behind why they sound that good. Because we, we live in a world where religion is supposed to be privatized because of the separation of church and state. And we could talk a long time about that concept as well. But the whole the whole point is that there the construct of the way we approach religion and the way we we divide the world in religious and secular has a political meaning. It's it it gives the state an extra power which the church used to have. So there's a a thing there where the political power um, has a usefulness for those ideas. It it makes a certain way of approaching the world in a scientific academic way, in a nationalist way, and so on, a lot more feasible when you have that separation. But I know I'm saying it a bit abstract, so if I have to make well, it more no, concrete, no, just to say something. I think this is very helpful. I mean, in some ways, they represent the Enlightenment agenda, don't mm -hmm. they, these ideas? So yeah. I, I suppose they were most explicit at the time of the late 18th century yeah. uh, and at the time of the French Revolution and so yeah. on, where they were uh, first became widespread. And also, it's it's just a historic fact that when the concept of religion, that's something not a lot of people know, but the concept of religion didn't used to have the same meaning. In fact, all over the world, you you almost don't find any, well, you don't find any other cultures than Western European ones where the word or the, the concept of religion, the way we define it today, was existent. There was nobody, neither the, uh, let's say, Hindus of the 12th century or uh, American indigenous Indians, um, in, in the ninth century or something, nobody would have been talking about religion. And I, I'm not just saying the word, but the concept wouldn't exist. So the concept, the way we use it today, really started taking off only in the 16th century. Um, it, it's a bit, it originates with the, in the tension between the Protestants and the Catholics, but it really picks off when those supposed wars of, of religion in the 16th century and, and 17th century, they, they started ending. And then you get those, uh, also the, the construct of the nation state. I mean, they really go together, literally. When the construct of the nation state is created, like the Treaty of Westphalia and that kind of stuff. But at that very moment within those treaties, it is also decided that a certain king in his dominion will have a certain religion. And religion at that time still didn't mean really what we meant because religions in, in plural 
would actually signify the different Christian denominations, we'd call them today. So religions in a plural sense in the 17th century was about the way Christians in separate or in different ways approached approached what they saw as religion, which was an internal focus or an inter internal f uh, devotion towards the divine, which is a completely different meaning than what it used to have before in the Middle Ages and certainly in Roman times. So the word religio in, in Latin used to refer to something, what you do more. It's more a, a kind of orthopraxis. It's, it's a devotion which has to be embodied. And so Protestantism takes away the embodiedness. It all becomes something in the mind. And there we actually bump on the, the first myth that it, religion by definition is something in your head, something that plays in, in belief and in faith and that kind of things. And that's why I'm saying it's, it's a political thing because at the moment the nation state arises as a concept, it didn't used to exist before either, but at the moment nation states are formed in Western Europe, immediately you see that religion as a concept, as a privatized concept, something that you have to keep within, also originates. And that's where the, the separation between what is religious, that's what you believe, that all, that's all fine. But in, in the marketplace, also something which arises at that same time. But in, in society, that's where the state has the power and what your personal beliefs are, that doesn't matter in society. Well, I'm, yes, I'm, it's beginning to make much more sense to me. Thank you for explaining that. Um, there's, I, there are quite a few ideas come up in my mind about that, but I'd like to get to the actual myths themselves and your critique of them, because... I think that would help us uh, move forward with the discussion. So the first myth, that it's about belief, mm -hmm. it's all about ideas in the head. So um, what's your critique of that? Well, first of all, if, you, if we take religion to mean what it means today, so uh, all cultures in the world have a religion, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Taoism, Christianity, Judaism. Let's start from that point. If we... If we start from that point, then you just notice that in a whole bunch of religions, it's actually not faith which is central, but it's the way you do things. You belong to a certain tradition because you repeat the stuff that your forefathers have been doing, and which is in the, let's say, the collective memory of your tradition. And so doing things like in a lot of Hindu settings will be a lot more at the forefront of what their religiousness is. But also in the so-called Abrahamic religions, you can also find it. Let's say one of the better examples is within Christianity, you've got the credo, or at least in Catholic Christianity, you've got the credo, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus Christ and in the church and so on and so on. It's a whole litany, as you perfectly well know. But not in, let's say, Islam. In Islam, the thing that you have to believe consists of two simple things. There is no God but the God, and Muhammad is one of his prophets. And that's it. So two simple things that you believe. The other four things, which consist, uh, well, you have the five pillars. One of them is what you believe in. The other four pillars is fasting, pilgrimages, things you wrote about in one of your last books. So what you see in, in, in Islam as well, what makes you a Muslim is, is let's say, four of the five uh, most basic tenets of the religion of Islam is about what you do and not so much about what you believe. And what you believe is pretty straightforward and nothing bizarre or extremely dogmatic. So that's, that's one aspect of it. Just if you look at the religious reality, it's not all about religious faith. And, and when you look at the way people do things, because then we get to the second part of that same myth that you're kind of forced to do certain things, um, that also is, is quite a myth. Because if you simply look within Islam, yes, supposedly five times prayer a day, but it's not like all Muslims do it. And so when you don't pray five times a day, it doesn't make you less Muslim or anything. But you could even draw that back to Christianity. One of my favorite examples is um, Christianity in the 15th and 16th century England and Scotland. 
Scotland. Uh, I take that example because I've once read a book about uh, witchcraft in those periods and I, I really loved the book. And within the book, there was the small paragraph where it said that in the 16th century, there were actually bishops and, and high ranking people of the elite who were complaining that nobody, almost nobody went to church in those days. So nowadays we think that Christian middle or uh, Christians from the Middle Ages all went devotionally to the church every Sunday at least and so on and so on. There was no discussion about it and something else was impossible, which just turns out to be historically completely untrue. Most people knew the stories of Robin Hood a lot better than their Bible stories and so on. And on top of it, when it comes to prayer and relating to the transcendent and so on, in the 16th century, it, it was half of it was animist. Most people were more concerned with elves and goblins and those kinds kind of creatures, but they were convinced they were very good Christians. So that's my point. I'm I'm not the one to say that, oh, but they were still animists, not really Christian. They themselves were completely convinced of being very good Christians. But on top of it, they also had those leftover animist IDs and so on. So it goes to show, and, and the things they did as well, they didn't go to church, but what they did do was, for example, put out bowls of milk uh, on, on the at the door or something for the elves and that kind of stuff. So even the rituals were more linked with the, with the nature spirituality, which was ingrained in their tradition, than with what we could call or what we would perceive as, as normal Christianity today. Well, that's very uh, interesting. I mean, until recently in Ireland, for example, where most Irish people would have considered themselves Catholic, um, a great deal of it was more or less as you describe. You know, um, most people believed in fairies. Um, Ireland was full of holy wells where people would tie little cloths in thorn trees above the well and, and pray as a form of prayer. Um, and, you know, I was once talking to someone about what it meant to be an Irish Catholic. And, and he said, oh, it's simple. It's, it's eating fish on Fridays. <laughs> you know, it was the practice yeah. of, of that. That's what it meant, uh, not beliefs. Now, I think this is, it makes total sense. I, I mean, I'm a regular churchgoer and I, I in the Church of England. And when I go to church and look around at the other people in the church, although everyone says the creed, um, I'm sure if you ask people, and sometimes I do ask people, that their interpretation of it is completely different. It's not as if they're all carefully schooled in exact meaning of the word substance and ousia and, you know, ancient uh, theological disputes sure, that lie sure. behind this creed. And I think that, for, I mean, I like going to church because I like gathering together with people from the local community. I like being in a holy place that's been a place of prayer and rites of passage for many generations. I like singing. I like the beautiful music we have. Um, I like praying together. I pray in private every day, but I like the idea of praying together in public. And I like the celebration of festivals through the liturgical year, the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels, the Feast of All Souls. And I mean, those are my uh, among my motives. Uh, and so all this makes personal sense for me. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So uh, and I think it does for most people who go to church. It certainly does. And and on top of, of like the communal aspect of it and the ritual aspect and, and certainly within the ritual aspect, you also have the, the aspect of beauty. The aspect of beauty of the songs in the church service or or just the, the images which are there. Beauty has always been a very great part of the attraction of religion. But the whole thing is, and that, that brings us back to the political aspect of it. If it's if it's simply about fate, it kind of reduces your human beingness to either what you do or what you think, and, and there's there's nothing extra. There's no extra spiritual dimension of beauty and, and of experience. I think that's the most important thing for, for myself. My my faith in God isn't even faith to begin with, not in the sense of I believe because somebody said it or because it's in the Bible or, or whatever. No, my faith in God comes from the actual experience of God being there, of, of, of really existing and and 
being something that you kind of have to deal with it because it if you don't deal with it it's like denying the light of the sun or something and so i think that's that's part of the political aspect of it by reducing faith or religion to faith and to beliefs you kind of take out every possibility of it being an related to something ontologically existing yes i i agree i agree i think that that's um but i think one of the problems that in a sense um christian churches have in a way fueled this misunderstanding um by in the early period of church history it became very important to the church fathers to it, when it became the religion of the roman empire and constantine and so on um all those church councils to define what the faith was as opposed to various heresies that part of christian does rather feed into this absolutely this myth. absolutely and it's also it's it's a very specific christian thing because uh the church father it's it's a good example and and you can trace it all through christianity and certainly when protestantism arises because protestantism is extremely focused on only faith only the scripture and so on so so yes it's it's a tendency within christianity to go to creeds as the focal point which uh, i think you can have a debate about why it was also useful to breach the the sociology of the Roman Empire, where you were kind of stuck in the layer in society because that was the way society was structured and you were a slave, then you'd always be a slave because that's the way things have to be in the hierarchical setup of those days. So when you have a creed and it it binds people within their belief it stops binding people within their tribal or within their social structure so it opens up possibilities when your society has has uh, kind of glued itself together in in strict uh, structures on a social level then i think it could be useful so there, there's a reason why it originated but what you see is a kind of outgrew its 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 usefulness and became a thing within itself within christianity and i stress or i emphasize that fact because it simply isn't replicable in the rest of the world other traditions had a different balance with the whole thing and that makes it interesting when we look at the world and at religions as things essentially of faith and belief that is because christians looked at the world essentially as faith and belief and we started dividing the world in a in a kind of christian mindset yes and i i think this was definitely exaggerated through the protestant reformation because the i mean in the roman catholic world where the liturgy until quite recently was in latin um it wasn't as if most people were busy thinking carefully about the exact meaning of the liturgy i mean going to mass or any other or vespers or whatever uh, was a right brain experience. Uh, I mean, it couldn't be a left brain experience engaging the whole linguistic um, thinking capacity because you didn't know what they were saying. Most people didn't know Latin. Therefore, it was all about the, the sounds, the chanting, the smell of the incense, the beauty of the building, the power of the liturgy, uh, the symbolic value of the communion and so on. And so as soon as the Bible was translated into vernacular languages in the 16th century um, and Protestants started studying the Bible, uh, then, of course, you've got endless disputes about interpretation of the Bible and who's got the right translation and which text means what. And then that leads to its, its most extreme outgrowth in the form of American fundamentalism invented at the beginning of the 20th century, which is the kind of religion that most people think of when they think of Christianity. Sometimes people, quite intelligent, educated people say to me, well, how can you be a Christian? Don't you believe in evolution? <laughs> and um, they take, and, and atheists like Richard Dawkins love the fundamentalists and the American fundamentalists because they represent such an easy target for them. Um, and this has then led to, it fuels this myth that it's all about belief because the newspaper is always full of, creation is trying to stop evolution being taught in schools and things mm -hmm. the fact is i've never heard anyone arguing about 
evolution in any Christian church I've ever been to is just taken for granted. It's not a big issue. Absolutely. And, um, it's and, an American thing. If it's an issue among Christian uh, communities, it's an American thing. And and, and like what you said, and, because it, it, it's something from the Christian fundamentalists which arose uh, or, or which originated in the end of the 19th century. Yeah. Yes, and even in America, I mean, when I'm there, I go to Catholic or Episcopalian service, sometimes Methodist. But again, in those mainstream churches, this isn't an issue. No, um, so, so even in America, it's a, a gross distortion. Yeah. yeah. Um, yet, unfortunately, the, the, this myth that I think you're absolutely right in questioning is constantly fueled and reinforced um, by American fundamentalists. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And like you say, that that's what the uh, what some, some people uh, on the on the more atheist fundamentalist side really love because then they've got their perfect sparring partner, so to say. But it really doesn't have much to do with reality, if you ask me. But of course, be, behind that reality is also, and that brings us to the second myth, the idea that you have this priest case. And again, that's a very specific Christian thing because. Uh, bon courage uh, to everybody who who wants to find the, the same kind of church set up uh, in in other culture. It's simply not there. Most religions are decentralized. Islam is decentralized. Uh, Judaism is decentralized. Hinduism is completely dis decentralized, and so on and so on. So it's a Christian thing, but you can't discount the fact that we had those church structures and so on and so on, and and they're very tied with patriarchy. But again, like you say, when, when you look at Christianity in its history, and, and certainly before the Protestant Reformation, it's not like the Christian hierarchy and the priesthood determined everything about Christianity, because you have this tendency within the patriarchy of the church to think in terms of Christ and of dogmas and of, of correct interpretations and of the, the right beliefs and so on. But most people, and you can simply see this actually everywhere in Western Europe because it's full of those small chapels and so on. Actually, I live in an old hermitage, which is uh, three centuries old. And so right beside my door, there's a, is a chapel and it's a married chapel, just like most chapels all over the place because more than 60% of uh, Christian devotional places in Europe we're devoted to Mary, not to Christ. And for me, that symbolically says something about the way Christianity actually was lived. It's not like Christ and the dogmas and the patriarchy was constantly at the forefront for most people. The, how do you call that, the Rahman in Islam, the compassion of Mary is the thing that drives most uh, most Christians in their daily devotions in all through the centuries, I think. Yeah, that, that's a bit counter the idea that the, the top and the hierarchy determines everything that uh, happens within a religion like Christianity. Your point about the, the political side comes in here again, because um, in many ways, what churches did was invented most of the things that states now do. Churches in the Middle Ages invented hospitals, hospices, schools, universities, um, uh, administrative structures, um, libraries. And what's happened is that as, as states have now taken over those things. They run health services, schools, universities, libraries, educational institutions and, and stuff. And all of those, of course, are structured hierarchically. You know, you have a minister of education and you have you have a civil service running the education. You had head teachers in schools and you, you have assistant teachers and stuff. I mean, and the same in hospitals, you have top doctors and stuff. So basically what we're seeing is is a, a secularization of what were originally hierarchical Christian institutions. And all of these have been taken over by states as opposed, and administered by states in a hierarchical and largely patriarchal fashion until recently, at least. So um, I think your political points are really interesting one, because we see that 
actually that there's a sense in which Christianity is a victim of its own success, having invented all these institutions, libraries, hospitals, and so on. Um, then the state takes them over, and then people say, you know, well, religion's all just about personal belief inside the head. Um, and so, so I think there's a really interesting point. But maybe we should move on to dogma three. Mm -hmm. We covered dogmas one and two pretty well. Yeah, well, um, once you see that the first and the second myth really aren't true, then the third one becomes easy. Because if you're not really constrained by dogma, if you're not really constrained by a certain hierarchy, then you could imagine that it isn't always clear where one begins and the other, uh, or one ends and the other begins. And that's actually what you see all over the world. So you've got... Mm, Let's say, for example, the, the most important saint in Pakistan, Lal Shabazz Kalander, where millions of Pakistanis go to every year for a, for the festival around his death. Uh, it's also visited by Hindus, to mention just one example of, of uh, Southeast Asia. And so you could go all through the world, let's say uh, in China, where you have temples where Confucius and Buddha and Lao Tzu of Taoism are all in the same temple on the same altar and so on. Or even the example I just gave or gave a bit earlier about Christians being actually half animist and so on and so on. All through history, you, you find those examples. And actually, we don't have a big problem with let's say, uh, those types of syncretism and, and fused uh, religion, when we're talking about more marginalized communities, let's say voodoo, for example, voodoo in Haiti, which everybody knows is animist and old African uh, traditions mixed with Christianity and so on, everybody accepts it. It's just bizarre that we think, when we think about the mainstream religions, that we somehow think that those had an essential uh, aspect to them, which has always been the same and which has never been perforated or fused with elements from outside. Although, of course, they obviously have. I mean, to come back to Mary, there's this whole debate. But if you look at the statues of Mary, for example, and you look at the statues of Isis, the, the god in the Egyptian tradition, there's a clear link with the way Mary is presented and the way Isis was presented, she was also a mother goddess and, and so on and so on. There's lots of links between them. And I think if, if you add everything up, then the chances are big that lots of statues of Mary today actually still have this bizarre link to uh, the, the goddess Isis uh, 2000 years ago. Well, I think this is a great strength of the Mary cult. I mean, I, in my daily prayers, I pray with the Hail Mary every day, and it's part of my own religious life. Um, but for me, uh, the, the idea that Mary is a one of the many forms of the goddess um, it, it is a strength of the Mary cult, not a weakness. Absolutely. Um, and I think that this is, it's, it seems to me obvious that this is a Christianization of a much older current. And the very fact she was proclaimed mother of God at the uh, Council of uh, Ephesus uh, on the place which was one of the main goddess centers in the ancient world. And she's believed by the Orthodox to have been assumed into heaven from there. So, I mean, it's so, the links are so clear. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, your third point, that the religions aren't clearly separable and, and stuff, uh, is, again, I think, very clearly the case. Although the one exception, again, might be post-Reformation Christianity, where various Protestant sects, uh, once you've split the, the Roman church, which had many strands within it, um, like Dominicans had one particular thing, Jesuits another, Franciscans and so, and then all the various kinds of contemplative orders of nuns and so on. All these different religious paths coexisted within a large umbrella organization. But uh, after the Reformation, then each bit had to be clearly defined. And so you've got Baptists with their particular thing about adult baptism. You've got Congregationalists with their particular thing about church government mm -hmm. and Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, it, all with distinctive belief systems uh, which defined themselves by these belief systems and also, of course, by practice. But that all did feed into these myths. So it's not mm -hmm. as if they've come from nowhere. 
Yeah, yeah and, of course, uh, of course, uh, they, they certainly don't come from nowhere because you actually have fundamentalists, of course, within every tradition and within uh, sometimes even small groups, you've got fundamentalist types, but there's simply no reason to see them as the norm. Even when you talk about those plethora of uh, Protestant groups and so on, once those Protestant groups started going all over the world, again, they started fusing with loads of other traditions. So you could find on the margins of a certain tradition, you'll constantly find those those fluxes. But actually, for me, there's two things that are important in all of this. One is that people would indeed claim, but if it's all mixed, then what is the usefulness of it? And that's what you said. No, no, that, that goes and shows the strength in a spiritual way. If Mary can take up a bunch of other strange, it just amplifies your idea of the the femininity of the divine, let's say, as opposed to its masculinity. Um, so that that's one aspect of it. But the other aspect is also, and that for me is a bit strange today when you talk about spirituality and and how people uh, who say that they're spiritual but not religious deal with it, that you've got this phenomenon which is in academic circles these days it's called multiple religious belonging. People picking stuff from different traditions either because they emerge themselves uh, for a long time or simply because they take out stuff uh, from new age books or whatever. And so then it's presented as if it's modern as if that's something new, as if before people stuck within their particular tradition and today we're free and we're modern and actually we're secularized, so we're able to pick and choose from different tradition. And for me, there's there's a problem there because it's historically it's untrue. This kind of stuff has always happened, not necessarily in the center of the elite power, but since when is centers of elite power a good example of what people in reality and in daily life are doing? It never has been. So once you go to the margins and the way people approach things, then you see something else. And then there's no reason for us today to act as if we're so much different than than all those people who came before us who, who were actually pretty good in infusing ideas. And that is what makes the concept of religion a bit difficult because first you create this concept as if the world is divided into separate traditions and separate religions. And then you're all startled the moment you start recognizing thousands of examples where actually the world isn't divided within religions. So it's a, it's a mm. bit of a bizarre thing. First you create a problem and then then you say you're the one to solve it, although it wasn't a problem for l most people to begin with. But doesn't this lead into another of your points? So the, the one about the um, spiritual but not religious. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. It is connected because what I think actually is kind of happening when people start saying they're spiritual but not religions, they're, they're acting as if you've got dogmatic religion on the one side and free spiritual stuff on the other side. Everybody knows it's a bit connected, but by, by separating the two, you again have kind of essentialized religion as such into this um, crude and forceful and aggressive dogmatic structure, which it isn't. And so that's a particularly modern Western thing. But once you start looking or projecting this onto the rest of the world, you, you get into problems. And one of the best examples is what we call Sufism today. Most people will nowadays think that you've got mainstream Islam and then there's this branch. You've got the Sunnis, the Shias, and then there's this other branch of Sufism and Sufism that's all spiritual and mystical and so on. And it's not liked by mainstream Islam. But if you look at history, that makes no sense at all. That's a complete distortion of Islam. Because Sufism, or Tasawwuf as it's really called, is actually infused within Sunnism, within Shiism. And so it's not a separate branch at all. It's simply what we could call spirituality today. And actually what you do if you say that Sufism is something different is like the, the Sufis never were people who followed a different path. The Sufis in the word itself used to mean those who attained a high spiritual level. Uh, so a bit like what we could call saints in, in the Christian tradition. But it's like... Mm. 
imagine that we look at the history of Christianity and we say, well, we don't like Christianity because it's this hierarchical church structure and so on, and it's dogmatic. But you had those saints, and those saints like St. Saint Francis of Assisi and so on, those were cool people. Those did a good job, they were very spiritual, and look at how they went about in the world doing nice things and so on. So no, no, I don't believe in Christianity, but I believe in saintism. And saintism, that's a different branch than, let's say, Protestants and Catholics. That's exactly the same thing, what we have been doing with the word Sufism and the way we juxtapose it to Islam. Nobody would, would in his right mind, think that it's a good way to separate saintism from Christianity or something. Uh, so, so it goes to show how we project certain ideas and, and divisions of religion on the rest of the world and it really uh, starts clashing with, with the reality and again there's a political point behind it of course because then you kind of as a secular people who think that they can be spiritual without tradition you, you do different things on the one hand you say that you know the truth the real spirituality you're the one to see it but all those others in the rest of the world even though they belong to the tradition you kind of know better than them what their real spirituality is supposed to be like and on the other hand you say that tradition doesn't matter that's that's a typical modernist assumption that the future is always better and what was in the past was bad and so on and so it gives you a possibility as a person to ditch everything which is tradition and for me just spiritually speaking there's a a problem there because it's within the residue and within the memory of tradition that there's lots of stuff also within the practices of meditation of prayer of pilgrimages everything all those spiritual practices had their use their their really good use to bring you to a deeper level and if you're just gonna assume that you're on the deeper level because, oh, I'm so spiritual but not religious, then I think you might check your ego a bit better. Yes, good point. Well, I mean, one of the general assumptions of secularism is this idea that we've seen through these religions, we're smarter. I mean, uh, personally, I because I think spiritual practices have a great value, and my two most recent books, Science and Spiritual Practices and Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work, are about the value of spiritual practices revealed by science itself. But um, it's many of them do connect with tradition, of course. Rituals connect with tradition, singing and chanting, pilgrimage. I mean, pilgrimages here in Britain, um, there's upsurge here as there is in ma many parts of Europe. This is a growing movement, and um, many of the people doing it are spiritual but not religious, as they describe themselves. But they're entering a great cathedral. And actually, I hope that this pilgrimage movement will make people realize that there's no need to separate off from everything to do with religious traditions. That's simply a deprivation, uh, a, a, a one shooting oneself in the foot, as it were, by just not having anything to do with traditions. But it is part of this modern arrogance. And um, a lot of the atheist movement seems to me extremely arrogant. I mean, you know, we've seen through the stupidity of these ignorant people who been uh, priests have forced them to believe this stuff because it's all about patriarchal power and stuff. Um, and, and ironically, um, I myself find that the, the, the most dogmatic belief system I actually encounter from day to day and week to week is, is dogmatic science, scientific dogmatism. Most people that I meet accept the dogmas of science. The, uh, my critique of them in my book, The Science Delusion, takes these 10 dogmas, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, most people accept them without question and through blind faith and entirely trusting in authority. Uh, they accept these dogmas not because they themselves have studied you know, whether the laws of nature change, whether the total amount of matter and energy is always the same, whether all heredity can be accounted for in material terms, whether memories are stored in the brain, whether the world's a machine, uh, and that sort of thing. They, they take all these things on faith because some professor or science popularizer or Richard Dawkins says so. And actually, it's a much more uncritical belief system 
than anything I encounter in church circles. When I go to church or talk to friends who are theologians or priests or bishops or lay people um, um, or monks, I, I, I find an extraordinary openness. I feel I can speak freely. Um, whereas the minute I enter a scientific institution, uh, it's very clear there are certain things you cannot question and, and that are treated as heresy. Um, I mean, I've uh, this is part of my own career has been concerned with this particular uh, dynamic of trying to open up scientific thinking and then being um, running foul of charges of heresy. Um, so uh, the irony of this uh, arrogant superiority and belief that we've gone beyond all beliefs is that it's associated with an extraordinarily narrow and dogmatic belief system. Absolutely. Yeah, and the whole thing for me is it's not just like it acts like religion. For me, the whole scientific mindset and is it's actually ingrained within a religion. I mean, it literally, it's not quasi-religious or it looks a bit like or it does the same thing. No, no. It is a religion because if religion isn't all the stuff that we're talking about, it's not just faith, it's not just hierarchy and so on. So so what is it? At, at a certain point, we have to ask, so what is religion now really? So for me, all in all, religion is a language. It's a existential, psychological, spiritual language. And it's not with words or with sentences, but it's with rituals, symbols, metaphors, and so on. And so if you look at religion as a language, it kind of opens up the whole thing. Yeah, sure, everybody has his language. And just like languages can fuse and create another language, that happened in history. And just like people can have, uh, be bilingual or something, sure, you can you can feel at home in two religious traditions and, and kind of uh, talk your way through them without a problem. And so the whole thing is every society has this type of language, which has metaphors and psychological concepts and so on, which, which are somehow interlinked. And it's difficult to say what the core is because it's a web of things, just like, again, language. And the whole thing about the more atheist modernist approach to the world is it acts as if it's kind of uh, outside of that possibility. But of course, it's, it's just, it, it also has its language. And within its language, it has a couple of emphasis, words it likes to use, like rationality, like neutrality, and so on. And that kind of makes it difficult. It's the only one. It's the language claiming of itself. It's not a language. It's like it says, I'm the referee of the, of the football game, while actually it's just a player on the field, which is religion. But it claims yeah. to be the referee, but it can't be the referee. It's just one of the several players. Well, I agree. I mean, this the sort of secular attitude. One of your dogmas is about secular. We live in a secular world, which is in every way better than a religious world. Um, one of the assumptions is that the secular point of view has risen above belief systems. It's neutral. It sort of looks down on these childish beliefs of you know, superstitious people who haven't been scientifically educated, as if from a, a higher vantage point of view of neutrality. But of course, it is a belief system itself. And as we've been discussing, and it's underpinned by this a dogmatic uh, kind of scientific philosophy of material mechanistic materialism, uh, which is the underlying belief system, uh, although rarely made explicit. Very um, rarely. It also has a it has a big mythology behind it as well, which I call the well, a lot of people have called the myth of the hero. It, it has this myth of the one that is constantly fighting battles and becoming better and going through towards progress and and so on. There's this huge mythology behind it, and the mythology it's it's everywhere. It's in every cultural product, whether it's Star Wars or Harry Potter or whatever. Those movies are actually written from the point of view of the myth of the hero. But it's it's heavily ingrained within academia as well. Yes, no, I agree entirely. Um, one of your other uh, things is the 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 um, the idea that religions are uniquely responsible for violence mm -hmm. in the world, and um, I must say this is something that I've uh, has annoyed me for a long time because I, I many of my friends are atheists or agnostics and. Um, 
I often hear this trope. The whole new atheist movement really was triggered by this. The 9-11 attacks um, uh, gave a publishing opportunity to people like Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, and Christopher Hitchens. Um, in fact, they got book deals because, uh, you know, here was this terrorist attack by Muslim fundamentalists on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and so on. And religion caused violence and, and therefore atheism was the way to be more peaceful humanity. Um, I mean, I've, so I've heard that argument many times, but of course, as, as you point out yourself, and if we actually look at the history of the 20th century, the most violent century in terms of mass deaths ever, you know, the, the deaths caused by communism in the Soviet Union, Stalin, I mean, the, the League of the Militant Godless, the persecution of Christians, I mean, millions, I mean, how many, 20 million, the Nazis, which were anti-Christian um, movement, uh, nationalist movement, Pol Pot in Cambodia, Mao Zedong in China, I mean, inconceivably large numbers of people, uh, whereas the total number of people executed by the Inquisition, I looked it up just for comparison, was over a 400 year history, I mean, it was about 5,000. Um, and we're talking you know, maybe 100 million victims of, of secular um, ideologies, all of which claim to be based on science and reason. Communism, after all, was supposedly a scientific theory. Absolutely. And um, Nazis and the as Nazi well. The, the whole show was also a very um, industrialized, scientifically underpinned process. Nowadays, we say it's pseudoscience and so on. But as you perfectly well know, the whole scientific world was completely convinced of racial theories, of racial hierarchies, yes. and for uh, hundreds you of years it. had tried to catalog everybody into races. It was the it was the eventual result of science. You can't say it any other way. Yes, exactly. It's, it's so, and eugenics was very popular among intellectuals on the left and the right in the 1930s. Um, and the Nazis were all in favor of industry, technology, you know, autobahns, Volkswagen cars, rockets, and so forth. Um, so this was not a, a, a anti-scientific, it was pro-scientific. And indeed, one could argue that these are the natural outcome of the Enlightenment, that the Enlightenment, which gives this cult of science and reason and, and also empowering states, as you were saying earlier, um, when yeah. it goes to these extremes, is is murderous. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, but again, it, it has to be fused with a certain worldview as well. And, and that part is often forgotten uh, also on, on the atheist side, where lots of the worldview is, uh, or, or uh, let's say the identitarian worldview is, is very much linked to nationalism. And I bring in nationalism because if you look at the history of the 20th century, the biggest murderous ID wasn't indeed religion, it was nationalism. I mean, that's that's beyond question because of two world wars being driven by nationalist ideologies. And, and that brings in a nice historic link because we tend to think of the, the example of the violence of religion is the Protestants versus the Catholics, what we call the religious wars of the 16th century and so on. But in fact, what actually happened wasn't that apart from how you interpret those wars, the end result, people think, well, nation states arise uh, and then those those wars are quenched and the nation state nowadays keeps a check on those religions so they don't start fighting again. And so we're more peaceful now. Okay, so two world wars further, we know that's not the case. But what you see is, of course it's not the case because the whole point is not that religion as such creates the violence, but it's the question remains, who has the monopoly on violence? Yes, it's true. In Western Europe, in the Middle Ages, the monopoly kind of resided in the church. If the Pope or the bishops or whomever weren't agreeing with a certain war or a certain conflict, then, then they could kind of put a stop to it. So they had a monopoly of violence. They could also decide when violence was uh, appropriate. But nowadays, it just lies with the state. So what happened was the monopoly of violence from the church 
went over to the monopoly of violence of the state. So that's where you have to look who has the monopoly of violence. There's there's nothing bizarre there. It's not religion as a as a causality or something. It's just religion within a context of having monopoly of violence. Yeah, then yes. But so it's the same for nationalism. In another way put, uh, for me, I also often use the term, it's not the fact that you believe in God that makes you violent. It's the fact that you think that you yourself are a God. If Christianity, at the moment that bishops and popes think that they know what God wants and God wants for them to thrive over the world and kill everybody who doesn't believe in them, then of course it becomes extremely violent. But it's the same for nationalism. If you think that you know what is best for the rest of the world and for the subjects, or let's say even in democracy it exists, if the Americans think that they know what democracy looks like so they can go and bomb 20 countries into democracy, then then it's all fine. We're bringing democracy, we're fine. Basically, that's playing God over other people. So for me, it's not the belief in God, which is a problem, but placing yourself in, in God's place. Yes. Well, that's a, a very interesting analysis. I, although I think in the Middle Ages, although the church had some monopoly of power and violence, it wasn't undisputed because there was always a tension between say the kings in England um, had, you know, who could appoint bishops? This was a big issue in the 12th century. And, and you know, did the king have the right to appoint the bishop or was it the pope? And so there was always a, a tension between the, the power, who had the power. And of course, there were lots of wars in the Middle Ages, uh, which were not um, monopolized by the church. I mean, there were civil wars in England by successions, the Wars of the Roses, for example, which was about one dynasty trying to take control of the throne rather than another. Um, so a lot of the actual wars that were happening were um, dynastic um, and and where they were, in that sense, secular. So, um, well, we we should be perhaps to finishing off with the because we should draw our discussion to a close. I think um, to keep within some kind of time mm -hmm. limit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, have we covered all your seven myths, or are there any yeah, left? Except we the one for science, uh, science uh, conflicting religion. But I mean, that's that's simply the whole of your work, and it, it kind of it's the same thing again. If you look through history, I mean. Christianity and all religions have always promoted uh, the search in different directions of truth. And so science actually originates within a, a very religious context. And on the other hand, you can cite dozens of examples where science becomes dogmatic itself and actually hereticizes people. And I think you're the perfect example of that one. So you know, that kind of is an obvious one. Yes. No, I agree. That's that's fairly obvious. And I think what's interesting is the is the way that the, our culture is actually moving on at the moment. I think that's what's so interesting about this shining a spotlight on these myths is that we are, I think, actually getting to a point where many people are ready to go beyond them. Just take the science religion issue, for example. Lots of scientific studies are now showing the value of spiritual practices, which is one of the main themes of my two most recent books. And in that sense, the scientific studies and the and the spiritual practices with their roots in religions are converging in a kind of mutually helpful way. Uh, it's not these studies of meditation and its effects on brain waves and stress levels are not designed to debunk meditation. They're designed to find out why it's working and what effects it's having. And so I think what we're actually seeing is a convergence of science and religion working together uh, in relation to spiritual practices, all of which have measurable effects. So it's not as if they're beyond the scope of science. They're not just abstract ideas in heads. They have measurable effects because they're practices. I think that that's one of the nice trends that you indeed see happening, that there is a this this uh, awareness of the you know, usefulness is not the right word but of the um experiential quality of certain practices and what they bring to human life which is eventually what we have to uh be interested in but for me it's also important that if we try to go beyond those myths one of the more important facets for me is that we also 
need to delve back in all traditions for more myths. Because, like I said, I think in, in the modern worldview, there is also an underlying myth. But in kind of uh, opposing most traditions in history all over the world, they had a plethora of myths. There was a variation of myths. There were myths of growth and myths of decay and myths of uh, fight and myths of peacetime and whatever. While we only have this myth of the hero. And, and even that myth is kind of truncated because most myths of the hero, they go up the, the heroes and then there's this fall. They, they get hubris and because of their hubris, they fall again. And that, that part of the story is mostly not thought about. So for me, part of the reason of um, opening up traditions again and seeing their inherent value and going beyond this, this modern secular religious uh, dichotomy is the possibility to open up our psychological and existential way of looking at the world by combining new myths in novel ways of, of looking at the world. And uh, you, you were recently also promoting the documentary about uh, Bohm. And I also watched it. I think it's brilliant. And for me, it's not a coincidence that Bohm could go so far in his ideas because he met Krishnamurti and who had a completely different mythological, traditional uh, thinking behind him, even though he didn't make it explicit all the time, but it was there. And so that's what you need. And you can kind of see that the ideas of, of people like Bohm are capable of bringing our worldview on a different level because they they bring in a certain different type of mythology i agree yes and i think what we're in at the moment is a very very interesting period because things are becoming much more open and you know i've spent years decades trying to broaden out scientific thinking and um, go beyond these dogmas and i Actually, um, no, I think things are opening up within the scientific world, partly because there's a new kind of modesty that's come about through the replica reproducibility crisis, where it turns out that most scientific papers in prestigious journals can't be replicated. Mm. Uh, and that's a massive blow, because scientists used to think, you know, we're objective, everyone else is subjective, we have the facts, and it's a completely impersonal objective facts. And you know, that style of writing with the passive voice, a test tube was taken, you know, as if science just unfolds in front of a detached, disembodied observer uh, 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 that, uh, that is it been a huge shock in the scientific community it produced an, uh, an atmosphere of humility that I've never seen before and so I think there's going to be more of an opening up of science um, right now scientists are constrained in what they can do by the funding systems and the institutional inertia that they work within as part of organized science I mean talk of hierarchical organizations uh, uh, um, which are essentially patriarchal. I mean, and there's a few more women than there used to be, but basically what we've got in science is exactly what people critique in the church. Um, and um, there's also, I think, uh, uh, an opening up through the spiritual but not religious movement and through things like pilgrimage, sort of crossing over, literally crossing over the threshold of churches and reconnecting with our own indigenous European traditions, um, which uh, until now it's you know it, it's worked on the principle of what some people call A B C anything but Christian. Um, you say it's all right to have a bit of shamanic drumming, you know, a sort of a, so a Zen garden, uh, you know, a, a bit of meditation, kirtan chanting, and a sort of overtone sounds from Tibetan bowls and all that. All those things are fine, but the Christian thing is completely taboo. Well, I think we're luckily growing out of that particular um, uh, way of thinking. I mean, it's still very widespread, but I think this opening up and including this opening up and looking at myths again, a process you're helping, I think, a lot through focusing our attention on these unconscious myths that we live by, um, makes it a very interesting time to be in. And this present pandemic, um, I think, is forcing, uh, accelerating uh, the change and examination that's going on today about where are we going and what's our culture all about. Absolutely.
Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, thank you, Yanis, for this conversation. Yeah, it was very, very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you.